Next matter on the docket this afternoon is N. Ray Judge Leo Booth. There are several motions and documents that have been filed just recently. We're going to refer all those to the merits of this case. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I would like to reserve 10 minutes of my time for rebuttal. May it please the court. My name is John Keeling. I'm an assistant special counsel with the Office of Special Counsel of the Judiciary Commission of Louisiana, who I represent here today. And we're here today concerning a recommendation that Judge Leo Booth of the 7th Judicial District Court be removed from office in order to reimburse the commission costs in the amount of $11,731.79 for various misconduct. I emphasize the only respondent judge in this matter is Judge Booth and Judge Booth only. That's the only person we're here to talk about today. Although the record is over 5,000 pages long in 23 volumes, this case is not as complicated as it might seem, just looking at the sheer bulk of it. Judge Booth does not deny the actual actions that the commission found to be misconduct in this case, although he fails to accept that they were in any way wrong or improper. But first, before we get into those specifics, a little background, just very briefly. In 2002, James Skipper was convicted for an array of serious drug crimes, four separate felony drug counts. He was offered a favorable plea deal, but ultimately rejected it because his close friend and nephew, Justin Connor, told him his family was going to disown him if he went to jail again. And the again part here is relevant. This isn't Mr. Skipper's first brush with the law. He had a prior federal felony conviction. He had prior misdemeanor convictions. So Skipper was originally sentenced to serve 80 years in prison for these very serious drug distribution crimes. This wasn't selling a small amount of drugs at a street level. This was reduced to 25 years before his sentence became executory. And we would submit that Mr. Skipper was fortunate at that. There was no multiple offender enhancement filed, which easily could have been based on his federal felony conviction. He was released on an appeal bond. So he didn't go to jail right away. Let me ask a quick question. Yes, Reduction from the 80 years to the 25, there's no quibbling over that being inappropriate. That was clearly permissible because it was done before the execution of the sentence. That, I, I thought I read that it was really three 25-year uh, terms to run concurrently rather than consecutively. That's correct, Your Honor. What happened is he was sentenced to three 25-year terms and a five-year term, because, again, we had four felonies. He said it wasn't really 80 years. It was... Yeah. Well, the original sentence was that they'd be consecutive, so the effect was 80 years. But the, technically, it was three separate 25-year sentences and one five-year sentence. concurrently. And they were changed to run concurrently. I understand. Initially, it was consecutive. It was changed to concurrent. Thank you. And again, this covered four separate serious felonies. In the years after his conviction, as is not uncommon, Mr. Skipper exhausted his appellate remedies before <clears throat> the Court of Appeal and this court, who all upheld both his conviction and his sentence and began filing motion after motion after motion after motion, trying to get out of jail, trying to get his sentence reduced, trying to do anything in the world that he could to get out of prison. Some of these motions included a motion to recuse Judge Booth, that Judge Booth, in his testimony, admits was damaging to him politically, that made serious allegations that Judge Booth described as blasting him in his own words. And you can find that and you can find that in volume 23 of the record, pages 5417 and 5427 to 28, Judge Booth's own words. These various motions, and there were a lot of them, Judge Booth routinely denied, including denying the last several as untimely, without holding a hearing for them. These motions almost uniformly raised issues of hardship, raised issues of Mr. Skipper's health, raised issues of his family situation. This brings us to 2008, when Mr. Skipper finally succeeded in getting out of jail through a reconsideration motion. 
This motion, again, as Mr. Skipper had mentioned, from the very beginning at his original sentence, through these various motions and appeals all the way through, only mentioned personal hardship on him and his family. In reviewing the briefs and over 5,000 pages of record and what myself and Judge Booth's attorney have to say to you today, it's important that the court remember that Judge Booth stands here today for three things, which I'm going to give you in chronological order. The first is engaging in an improper ex parte communication with Mr. Skipper in 2008, a series of letters both ways. These letters can be found in volume six of the record, pages 2574 to 2587 for the letters of Mr. Skipper, and at volume 17, pages 4046 to 4047 for the handwritten letter of Judge Booth back to Mr. Skipper. Judge Booth does not deny having written to Mr. Skipper or having reviewed his letters. He does not deny that they were not served on the district attorney. He does not deny that they were not put into the record. No one else was involved in writing the, these letters, and their contents speak for themselves. Mr. Skipper's letters are clearly attempting to curry favor, to curry sympathy. Again, these hardship issues to try to get his own release. And Judge Booth's letter to Mr. Skipper expressly gives him advice on what he's going to need to get out of jail namely the cooperation of the district attorney, which we'll get to in more detail momentarily. The second thing Judge Booth did, which is the ethical misconduct, is he held a hearing on this reconsideration of sentence motion years after the deadline for this had passed. Judge Booth does not deny holding this hearing or letting Mr. Skipper out of jail. Thirdly, Judge Booth failed to recuse himself from this reconsideration hearing despite having a strong personal interest in what happened there. Judge Booth does not deny that he did not recuse himself. Now I'd like to in more detail discuss each of these incidents. Let's begin with the simplest, which is the ex parte communications. Again, they're in the record. I would encourage each justice to read them. They are clearly improper ex parte communications. Mr. Keeling, can yes. I ask you a question, please? Certainly, Your Honor. At the time that these ex parte communications were ongoing, was there uh, between the judge and the defendant, uh, whatever his name was, Skipper, uh, was there an adversarial proceeding ongoing or was he just confined in the penitentiary? He was confined in the penitentiary after Judge, Skip, after Judge Booth wrote him back. There's three letters. Mr. So Skipper writes to Judge Booth with nothing pending, although keep in mind he's repeatedly filed these various motions after being incarcerated. Judge but Booth? I guess what the question is I want to ask is conviction was final. Long ago final, yes, yes. Your Honor. Okay. After the letter from Judge Booth to Mr. Skipper, a new motion gets filed, and Mr. Skipper writes to Judge Booth as well. In his letter to Mr. Skipper, Judge Booth expressly tells Mr. Skipper what he's going to need to get out of jail, along with Judge Booth's good graces, of course, which is cooperation from then District Attorney John Johnson. Again, Judge Booth doesn't deny writing this letter. He doesn't claim that anyone else influenced him to write this letter. He is responsible for its contents, which say nothing about scheduling or any of the permissible grounds for an ex parte communication. It is on its face a clear violation of Canons 1, 2A, and 3A6 of the Code of Judicial Conduct, as well as Article 5, Section 25C of the Louisiana Constitution. And this court has addressed this sort of communication before and found that's utterly improper. The, the hearing officer found that this was not problematic, did he not? I'm sorry, Your Honor? The hearing officer found that this was not problematic. That's correct, Your Honor, but the hearing officer does not bear final responsibility for decision-making. Sure, I understand matters. that well. But, um, and and, and the let, there was one letter from Judge Booth to Skipper? Correct, Your Honor which again contains specific advice on what would be needed to get out of jail. This court in Enre Fusilier, and I may be mispronouncing that, case number 02-1661 decided in 2003, found, a, available to be found at 837 Southern 2nd 1257, clearly states these sorts of ex parte communication seeking help, and certainly giving help, are utterly improper. Again, Judge Booth does not deny this correspondence, he doesn't deny the DA never got a copy. Uh, he, he doesn't he can't, deny. He can't, stop, he can't stop an inmate from writing him, correct? He cannot write the inmate back, Your Honor. I, I know, but he can't stop the inmate from writing him. 
he cannot stop the inmate from writing him, but he doesn't have to. Once he realizes what the communication is, he uh, certainly. Something earlier you said implied that he, he couldn't get the letters from the inmate. And he, maybe once he gets them, he has to handle them properly, which would include serving them on the district attorney, putting them into the record, and certainly not personally responding to them. Certainly so the most every, problematic. Every, every letter I get from a prison, I should have uh, sent it to the DA? Uh, well, you certainly you should get, I mean, you, you get what you call pen pals every time you send somebody to jail, and they write you frequently. But you, but you clearly shouldn't give them advice on what they need to do to get out, Your Honor. I never did that, but. Uh, and that's really where the main problem is here. In which Judge Booth again clearly did. Uh, his letter is in the record. You, you, all of you can read it for yourselves and see what he says in it. Next, after a new motion was filed by Mr. Skipper, Harton to have heard from Judge Booth, which he testified to at his, at his various appearances and is in the record, applied for yet another reconsideration of his sentence. The past several of which have been denied is untimely without a hearing, but this one Judge Booth decides to schedule. In our brief, we cite several cases from the Third Circuit, which has appellate authority over this judicial district, noting that, this is a, that there is a jurisdictional bar to a judge hearing request for reconsideration of sentence which are not filed timely. It is undisputed that this one was not timely. That was several years after the deadline to do so. Judge Booth doesn't claim that was timely. Instead, he says that the fact that the district attorney didn't object eliminates this error, makes it all okay. This is simply untrue. This court has long held that in civil as well as criminal matters, but specifically for us today, criminal matters, subject matter jurisdiction, which is what we're talking about, can't be waived. The very old case of State v. Crosby, a 1976 case, 338 Southern 2nd 584, dealing with plea bargains, a case that's used a lot, expressly says subject matter jurisdiction you can't waive either side. Judge Booth's brief states that there's no cases expressly saying that the district attorney can't waive jurisdiction, but this isn't relevant. How could such a case exist? Mr. Keeley, did you just, did you, just, uh, did you discover whether that was a common um, occurrence in that judicial district? Based on Judge Booth's testimony, it seems that it was. This is a two-judge district, keep in mind. Although I would emphasize we are only here today concerning Judge Booth. Both judges did it? Uh, we, that's not entirely clear. We know that uh, Judge Booth did it. Both may ha very well have. Uh, but again, we're only here today concerning Judge Booth. Other judges may have done things wrong. But we're only here today concerning Judge Booth. You know, and you indicated earlier that, that he, he denied doing anything wrong. But as I read the record and look at some of the statements that he made, uh, you know, with reference to the, the letter that you referred to a few minutes ago, he admitted that, that, he, that, it, that the letter could be construed as giving Mr. Skipper legal advice. Is that correct? He did, but he, never, but he never conceded that was a violation of the Code of Judicial Conduct or the Constitution. And then he, he made some statement to the effect that, well, whether this was proper or not proper to do it this way, I was saving the, the constituents money by making practical decisions, i.e. decisions contrary to the law and the, and the ethical canons about wasting taxpayer money for no reason. Yes, and Judge Booth's briefs and statements are rife with those sorts of references. And maybe I should state it a little more clearly. Yeah, I, I don't take that as, as, I don't take that as saying I did nothing wrong. I take that as saying I did something wrong, but I don't care. I think that's correct, Your Honor. I think that's correct. What he's saying is that he doesn't, e either way, frankly, it's equally problematic. Either he doesn't think it violates the ethical standards, or he doesn't care or both. Again, uh, legal error can be misconduct. This standard was first announced in the court case, which is cited in our brief. To summarize, egregious legal errors on issue of clear and determined law, errors made in bad faith, or patterns of legal error can all be ethical misconduct. Here we got all three. Judge Booth admits he's done this on other occasions. It's clearly an egregious error. Jurisdictional bar cannot be clearer. And it was made in bad faith. Judge Booth granted Mr. Skipper's motion not due to hardship, the only grounds cited in the motion, but to exonerate himself and for his own personal benefit. You need look no further than his reasons for judgment, found at volume six of the record, pages 1417 to 1424. And again, I would urge this court to review this very closely. Same as by Judge Booth speak for themselves. And again, his actions in this regard are violations of canons one, 2A, 2B, 3A1, 
of the Code of Judicial Conduct, as well as Article 5, Section 25C of the Louisiana Constitution. This leads us directly into the last act of misconduct for Judge Booth, his failure to recuse himself. Judge Booth claims that he did not need to recuse himself in this matter because he wasn't biased against any party and could be fair, and allegedly the Code of Criminal Procedure did not mandate it. This is wrong on two levels. First of all, we respectfully disagree that the Code of Criminal Procedure didn't mandate it. Article 671A1 specifically says that a judge must be recused in a criminal matter if he is, and this is a direct quote, personally interested in the cause to such an extent that he would be unable to conduct a fair and impartial trial. Again, let's look to Boot Judge Boo's reasons for judgment, which say nothing about hardship, not a thing in the entire reasons for judgment. Again, the only grounds Mr. Skipper was raising. It does mention a mission to injure me, Judge Booth, with a view towards removing me from office. That's volume six, page 1423. And discusses actions resulting in extremely adverse publicity to this court, Judge Booth, which tarnished this judge and the local judicial system. That's on page 1417, volume six. This shows a very strong personal interest in Judge Booth in this perceived self-exoneration, in this attempt to make the person he viewed as behind it look bad. Secondly, even assuming for the sake of argument that Judge Booth had not been required to recuse under the Code of Criminal Procedure, which we do not concede, but just for the sake of argument, this court has held that a judge can be, commit ethical misconduct by failing to recuse if no reasonable judge would hear the case, given the circumstantial evidence of possible bias or prejudice. Uh, that's from N. Ray Cook's case number 96-1447, decided by this court in 1997, found at 694 Southern 2nd, 892. This is clearly the case here. Again, Judge Booth's actions in this matter violated canons 1, 2A, 3A1, and 3C of the Code of Judicial Conduct, as well as the Constitution. Having established Judge Booth's misconduct, we turn to discipline. Now, the Judiciary Commission has recommended removal from office, the most grave sanction this court can impose on a judge. The so-called chase-on factors are not directly applicable in a removal case. However, they are ordinarily given in case this court should decide other than removal. I would note, however, that every single chase-on factor mitigates towards a severe sanction. Judge Booth is a senior judge. He's not new to the bench. He's not someone who's inexperienced. He has an extensive history with the commission, including prior formal charges that were resolved by a now expired deferred recommendation of discipline agreement and cautionary letters dealing with, among other things, failure to recuse, ex parte communications. This is not his first time with these sorts of issues. This court has long held that removal is reserved only for certain types of misconduct, including, relevant for us today, judges who use their office improperly for personal gain. It's from In re Whitaker, 463 Southern 2nd, 1291, a 1985 case. Again, Judge Booth's reasons for judgment make it clear what his motivation was. There is a case actually analogous to this one, that of Judge Joan Benge. In re Benge. 09-1617, decided in 2009, her judicial case anyway, 24 Southern 3rd, 822. In that case, Judge Benge awarded a litigant a little over $4,200, taking it at the most expansive amount possible, in a personal injury case for reasons other than the law. And what those reasons were were never really fully fleshed out. Judge Benge was removed from office for that. Here, Judge Booth awarded 13 years of freedom to Mr. Skipper, a repeatedly convicted felon and drug dealer, for reasons that are obvious in Judge Booth's reasons for judgment. He's told you why he did it. You need look no further than his reasons for judgment. We respectfully suggest that, if anything, this conduct is more severe than that of Judge Benj. But again, frankly, the worst that can be done is removal from office. Judge Booth has filed numerous motions which have been referred to the merits. We would only note that they're all pointless. They would create only additional delay. Keep in mind the three factual issues that he stands before you for. 
ex parte communications that he doesn't deny making. Quirk error, egregious legal error that he does, cannot find a way to say the law would have allowed him to do what he did. In failure to recuse, which he clearly didn't do in a case where he clearly had a strong personal interest as shown by his own reasons for judgment. In conclusion, we have a judge who admits most of his wrongful actions, but doesn't want to accept the consequences of them. Judge Booth was a senior judge and had been repeatedly counseled by, commission, by the commission concerning at least somewhat similar conduct in the past. Again, I know this court will review the record in this case most carefully, but please pay special attention to his reasons for judgment because they tell you what you most need to know here. Let, let me ask a question procedurally in this matter. Of course, it was heard by the hearing officer pursuant to procedure that was established. Then the commission called some of the witnesses that had testified before the hearing officer to testify, or for, for, the, for the Judiciary Commission to members to question. Is that accurate? Correct, Your Honor. Were, were any new witnesses called, or was it limited to the witnesses that were called before the um, hearing officer? The only person who did not actually testify before the hearing officer was Justin Connor. However, Justin Connor did testify in a deposition with Judge Booth. And in addition, Judge Booth subpoenaed him for the hearing officer hearing and did not call him. We don't know why. Moreover, if, if it was some issue of him not showing up or responding to the subpoena, he sought no relief over it or any way to compel him to appear. So Connor's testimony was introduced? Correct. Before the Judiciary Commission, right? Yes, through his deposition, yes, Your Honor. And and uh, was, was, did, was he cross-examined during that uh, deposition? Correct, Your Honor. Okay. There, there were some references to, to Judge Marshman's testimony. Is, is that in this record? And, and if so, how did it get in there? In places there is some, in places there is not. Throughout his defense in this matter, Judge Booth has sought to place blame on others. One of these attempts involves his claims that somehow Judge Sharon Marchman has tainted these proceedings. She is a member of the Judiciary Commission in good standing, president of the District Judges Association, and recused herself in this matter. She did not participate in the decision to accept formal charges. She did not sit as a commissioner for the commission hearing. She did not participate in the commission's decision to the degree of literally not being in the room. Let me ask this, and, and there was a, a, so a deposition was taken of her. Is that part of this record or it's not part of this record? Parts of it, I believe, are, although I'm not totally positive, Your Honor. The commission has uh, removed certain parts of the record for well, confidentiality was... reasons because they refer to either a count that was not proven or to other cases involving other judges. And again, we're only here today concerning Judge Booth. Okay, and that was my next question. There's complaints about redaction of the record. Who made the decision what to redact? Uh, I mean, let me ask you this first. Were, were there redactions? And, and I think your answer to that is yes. Uh, clearly less, Your Honor, and that's not hidden in the first page of the uh, index. The commission says we've redacted parts and gives the site to the commission, to this court's rule saying that for a count not proven, which there was one here, for complaints against other judges, which are not at issue here, and to protect the confidentiality provisions that attach to those sorts of things, parts were re redacted. Uh, that was a decision made by the commission. Our office did not request it, did not participate in it. Okay, final question. When a judge uh, gets a motion from a party and schedules a hearing and no one um, objects to the matter going forward. You're suggesting that it is a potential um, violation of the of the canon canons applicable to judges if the judge does not recognize that that is a that that matter lacks subject matter jurisdiction. Uh, we would suggest that that situation is no different than any other legal error, that the quirk test can be applied to it. If the jurisdictional issue is one that's clear and determined law about which there's no doubt, then yes. The, the hearing officer came to the opposite conclusion, though, did he not? No, the hearing officer felt that the, it was quirk error, that the, it was egregious legal error. 
he uh, did not believe he did not find the need to recuse or the ex parte to be improper. My understanding, and, and I could be wrong, is that he suggested is this a jurisdictional or a procedural bar? And, and I was on the impression, I could be wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, that he came down on the side of it being a procedural error because the DA was there and didn't object to the matter going forward. Mr. Skipper was there and didn't object to the matter going forward, and therefore he believed that it was a procedural bar, not a jurisdictional bar. Uh, am, I, am I mistaken? I do know that he found it to be misconduct as far as whether he found it jurisdictional or otherwise. I just don't recall, Your Honor, and I apologize for that. Okay, but he did not find it to be misconduct. Uh, I was. I do believe that he did. However, I would respectfully suggest that the hearing officer's determination of that is not relevant. We stand here with the commission's recommendation. Sure, I understand. And they are not bound by what the hearing officer found on those issues. All right, I understand. I'm just trying to get some clarification. Certainly, Your Honor, and I apologize. I can't be a bit, a bit clearer for is you. Is there any deference at all? Yeah, I don't know. In our disciplinary proceedings, I think we accord the hearing committee manifest error deference. Is there any deference at all uh, accorded to the hearing in these proceedings? Under, the, under these rules, there isn't. Now, ordinarily on questions of witness credibility, there could be, but these are different types of proceedings, and those rules that exist for lawyer discipline do not exist here. It's just a different procedure. Uh, the commission is, has original jurisdiction over this, do they not? Well, this court has original jurisdiction. Well, but, now, I mean, but the commission has. When the commission it. files something with us. Correct, Your Honor. And I believe we've said that this court's jurisdiction is triggered by the commission filing something. Have Correct, not? Your Honor. Just very briefly, because I do want to reserve some time for rebuttal. In his brief emotions, Judge Booth blames everyone but himself. He's expressed no remorse other than for the expense and inconvenience of these proceedings. Unfortunately, and no one takes joy in this, in this circumstance, and considering the gravity of the misconduct, the Commission felt it had no choice but to recommend removal from office. Judge Booth exploited his office for his own benefit and still does not accept responsibility for his actions or their wrongfulness. I would like to reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal, if I may. Thank you. Sorry, Counselor, there was a motion for somebody to enroll as attorney in this case on behalf yes, Your Honor, that would be Mr. Chris Booth. Uh, he's seated at the end of the table on that end. Granted. We'll grant that. Thank you. Madam Chief Justice, Justices, I am Patrick Booth. I represent the respondent, Judge Leo Booth, in this case. <clears throat> Judge Booth is accused of engaging in three actions that were deemed to be by the Commission or alleged to be by the Commission to be uh, in, illegal or improper, and there was an underlying allegation of bad faith as his motive for all of these. And since that, um, since that allegation is fundamental to and underlies all of the allegations, I, will, I would like to address the legalities of what was done in the first, in each of the three counts, and then address the motive issue as one <coughs> related to all three counts. Uh, the first count alleges that Judge Booth committed an error of clear and determined law when he set for a hearing a motion to reconsider sentence that had not been timely filed. Uh, Article 916 of the Code of Criminal Procedure specifically confers jurisdiction on the district court for motions to reconsider sentence. Even after the case has been appealed and the trial court's jurisdiction has been divested, there are still some types of motions for which the trial court can still exercise jurisdiction. Motion to reconsider sentence is one of those, provided it's properly filed. Now, there's no suggestion that this motion was not properly filed except as to its timeliness. That's the one issue. Now, it would was seem... Was this not the same motion that had been denied repeatedly? It's not exactly the same motion, but it, it alleges many of the same grounds, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> So the question before the court, before Judge Booth's court, was whether this motion had been timely filed. First of all, no one had questioned it, so it wasn't really even a question. But timeliness is the jurisdiction to decide whether it's timely, whether it's properly filed, must include uh, jurisdiction over 
whether it's properly filed. I mean, how, if he's got jurisdiction when it's properly filed, he must have jurisdiction to be able to decide whether it's been properly filed. And the only objection or the only problem with this is its timeliness. Now, the time limitation, yes, had passed. This, this motion was filed after the time limitations had expired. However, this was a practice that has been historically done. And although Mr. Keeling apparently is not clear on whether it was done by both judges, it absolutely is clear that it has been done by both judges for years. There's Several witnesses testified to it. Oh, that, that's what I was going to ask you about. There's evidence in this record that that was something that was done routinely by both judges in the district? Absolutely, Your Honor. Uh, testimony of Derek Carson, who was the indigent defender, uh, specified that he had had a number of cases over his years as the indigent defender in front of both of these judges in which these circumstances occurred, where an untimely motion not objected to by the state was heard and granted. Also, the district attorney, John Johnson, uh, confirmed that as well. Now, when you say routinely done, it wasn't something that was done every day, but several times over a period of years it had been done. This was certainly no special exception made for this one case and for this one defendant. <clears throat> um, as we might expect, there is never going to be, there is no reported case where a court of, where a defendant has filed an untimely motion, the state has not objected to it and consented to the granting of the motion, and then an appellate court ruled on that, presumably because no one would ever appeal that. If the state was in agreement, the defendant is happy that his motion has been granted, naturally that's never going to be appealed. And so there's no, there's no controlling precedent, no, no uh, case reported that has this particular fact pattern in it. So it's not as if there were just clear uh, uh, cases out there showing that this was the wrong thing to do. Even Judge Thibodeau, the chief judge of the Third Circuit Court of Appeal, who was the hearing officer in this case, had to ask during the trial, is this something that can be waived? And he, had to, and he requested briefs from the parties on this issue. Now contrast, the chief judge of the Third Circuit Court of Appeal requesting briefs and asking a legitimate question to a district judge ruling from the bench on a case that's one of over a hundred on his docket for that day when he's got both parties in front of him agreeing to it, consenting to it, and asking for it to be granted. To consider that to be judicial misconduct would be extreme. How late was it? Excuse me? How late was it? Uh, it's, there has been some confusion over what the last possible date was because at one point he was given two years, another point he was given three. At the very latest, his motion would not have, would have had to be filed by 2007 to be timely, and this was filed in 2008. However, there is some indication that it might have been untimely had it been filed even in some parts of 2006. What, what about the situation the where he was given three years to file something that the code says you give 30 days for? Uh, well, I think what the uh, code provision in question was, was uh, the, the defendant has a certain amount of time following right. the, the sentence in order to, uh, motion, to make a motion to reconsider, unless the judge sets a different time. And I think in one uh, instance, the judge had given him two years, and I think that might have been before the, uh, that was when he got the 80 years. And then when that was changed to run concurrent, so it was effectively reduced to 25 years, I believe it's at that point where I think Judge Booth gave him three years. But, but this is not a case where it's just a busy day in court and this came up and, and nobody realized it. You're, you're ignoring the, the letter that Judge Booth wrote to Mr. Skipper in which he basically laid out this procedure. I'm not ignoring it at all, Your Honor, and I, I certainly will be addressing that. And if you'd like me to now, I can... I can well, it's a good time since, it, it, in my estimation, it, it, it relates to uh, this event. Certainly. Um, the... Uh, Alleged ex parte communications, <clears throat> or they were ex parte communications, the, alleged, the communications at issue here involved a letter from Mr. Skipper to Judge Booth, a letter back from Judge Booth to Mr. Skipper, and then another letter in response to that from Judge, uh, Mr. Skipper back to Judge Booth. Now, in the initial letter, Mr. Skipper to Judge Booth, uh, for the most part it was a typical I want out of jail letter, one that every judge in the state has received a million times. It also made a few misstatements regarding Judge Booth's intention that uh, suggested that Judge Booth had hatred for him or had a point to make with him. <clears throat> Judge Booth responded, one, by clearing up the misstatements. I have no hatred for you, Mr. Skipper. I have no point to make with you. He affirmed that he is fair in his decisions. He addressed the, what 
would really be an administrative issue saying that he, nothing can be done without the state's waiver. And on that issue, Your Honor, I would suggest this. Suppose I'm an attorney in a case and the other side has filed a motion for summary judgment. And I've got a time limit within which I have to oppose that. And I've missed that time limit. So I call up the judge and I say, Your Honor, I'd like to file an opposition to this motion. And the judge says, well, you have to get the consent of the other side. Is that judicial misconduct? Is that an ex parte communication rising to the level of judicial misconduct authorizing removal from office? I mean, that's, a, that's not legal advice. It's simply a, a, a matter of fact. You know, you, you have to get the consent of the other side. And it's certainly not saying go file a motion and then seek consent of the other side. It's just saying this is a fact. You have to have the consent of the other side to do this. And it was it, Judge Booth never in any place in that letter suggested that Mr. Skipper file a motion. <clears throat> but, he, but he tells them, uh, you know, with reference to your modification of sentence, I'll always keep an open mind, and I certainly would be fair and objective in this matter. That's not conveying a message to Mr. Skipper in your, in your mind? Uh, with regard to a modification of sentence? Yes. I, I, don't, I don't think that he was saying you should file a motion. I just said, uh, I think he just said that I will always be fair and open-minded. And right. And then he, he was writing in response to a letter that he got that said, you hate my guts, right? Exactly, yes. He'd so he was responding, look, I'll keep an open mind and I'll always be fair. Right. But if you want to file a motion, you need to get the consent of the district attorney. Exactly. And it was Mr. Skipper who, of course, was, was uh, talking about wanting out of jail. Well, he didn't write right. to him out of the clear blue. He wrote to him in response to a, a right. letter that he got. And he goes on to say, as I indicated earlier, nothing would please me more than for you to use your talents in a constructive manner. What do you take that to mean? Well, I, I, I think it's, it's self-evident, really. I mean, it's, it's simply which, saying which, what that talents, I, which, What talents is he uh, referring to? I have no idea. I mean, whatever talents Mr. Skipper would have. Mr. Skipper had devoted almost all of his talents to that point. Meaning his, talent, meaning his, talents, his talents are wasted if he's in jail. And he'd like to see him use those talents in a constructive manner out of jail. I don't think it suggests that at all, Your Honor. Lots of people have done very constructive things while in jail. It, he's talking about modifying the sentence. Mr. Skipper was talking yes, about Yes. Well, as far as, as, as far as you getting any modification of your sentence, I always keep an open mind, and I would love nothing more than for you to use your talents in a constructive manner. And you don't take that to be some sort of a suggestion that, you know what, if you file this motion, you may very well be successful. I don't think he's saying that it's going to be successful. I, I don't think that says that at all. I think he says, in, in fact, very explicitly says, nothing's going to be done on this if the DA doesn't consent. I, mean, I, I think he, it, 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 absolutely the opposite of promising to grant the motion. It specifically says you've got no chance without consent of the other party. So, I mean, I, I don't see how it at all promises Mr. Skipper anything. You, you just stated yourself a few minutes ago that it's a common practice with these two judges uh, for the district attorney to not object to untimely motions. Uh, well, it depends on what you mean by common. Oh, a, a said, number of cases. A number of cases over year, a period of uh, years. You, you said, uh, I will go back and look at your, your, your statement. You said a few times a year. It's not uncommon. I don't know. I said a few times over a period of years. There were, a set, there were, I don't know, half a dozen or a dozen cases mentioned in the course of this proceeding where that had happened in front of the various judges. Mr. Booth, how long had this, had this practice predated Judges Booth uh, to the bench? Uh, we believe that it did, Your Honor. And, and um, of course, one complication in that. Who was the judge there before that? Judge? Excuse me, Your Honor? Who were the judges before Judge Booth? Um, uh, judge Johnson succeeded yeah. Judge Glenn Grimion. Uh, Judge Booth succeeded Judge uh, Falkenheimer. Falkenheimer. Judge Falkenheimer did the same thing? Um, it's, uh, we believe they did. Uh, Mr. Johnson, the DA, testified a little bit about that. And uh, what he talked about is that these time limitations had not been as strict before and that there had been a sort of open-ended time, or at least it was their impression that it was. And so these, these time limits had, had been sort of more recent. But he did suggest that it had been done, you know, over the years, uh, it, all the time. Well, not, not in every case, but, I mean, over a long period of time. 
Did Judge Booth suggest to Mr. Skipper that he needed to get the consent of the DA or he wouldn't have a chance? Yeah. I think he did. I think he honestly, he certainly did. He said, uh, no judge can help you if the DA doesn't some wait. advice. Well, I, I, again, I, I, would, I would refer to the, uh, the analogy I made with the motion for summary judgment. I mean, you know, I, I, can't, I can't accept this pleading unless you sign it. It's technically legal advice. Um, you know, I, I, can't, you know I'm not, I can't do this unless the other side agrees. You know, if you want to call that legal advice, then, I mean, theoretically you could. But, I mean, it, there are just, I mean, there are certain... It's coming years and years and years after the sentence. I think that is suggesting what to do. Well, Your Honor, the, he had just received a letter from Mr. Skipper saying he wanted yeah, out of jail. He doesn't have to respond to him at all, does he? No. Well, he doesn't have like to respond. Like the rest of us don't respond when we get letters from people in jail. We don't write them back and say, fine, go talk to the DA and get him to waive something. Well, I don't think that he's – well, first of all, he didn't say to talk to the DA. No. Second, he didn't say file a motion. What he did say was – Nothing can be done without the consent of the DA. And he is dealing with, this, with an attorney here. He's not just dealing with an ordinary prisoner in jail. This is a pro se defendant representing himself. Mr. Skipper's an attorney? No, he's a pro se attorney representing himself. Okay. Um, you know, the, the letter was handwritten. Was the letter on official court stationery or what type of a... Uh, my recollection, Your Honor, from the, uh, seeing it in the record, was that it was not on court stationery. And it was, it was handwritten. And, and, and it be, it, the letter begins by Judge Booth complaining to Mr. Skipper about allegations that, that he has made and about trying to influence him with a, with a number of minute, through a number of ministers. And uh, it talks about a deal. He came up with a deal that I never heard of, which was obviously calculated to embarrass me and cripple me politically. Okay, so he's complaining about all this. Then he goes to talk about modification of the sentence and how that could how that could could happen. And I really want to see you use your talents in a constructive manner. And then it ends by saying you will be treated fairly, and when and if your conduct merits it, you will learn that to be truthful and forthright will get better results than the methods you have employed up to now, described earlier in the letter. Now you don't take this as conveying a message to Mr. Skipper? Well, I, I take it as conveying a message to him that attacking the court has, dis, has, has been a problem, has well, been a problematic behavior on his part. I don't take it as telling Mr. Skipper, I'm going to let you out of jail. It, it you, you know, this, this could be taken as complaining that, about what he said, dangling the carrot of a release from jail ahead of him, and then telling him, you better change your story. There's nothing about changing anyone's story other than not making these wild allegations he was making against Judge Booth in multiple complaints, multiple uh, motions to re motions in in his case, complaints to the Judiciary Commission, and, <clears throat> and and this is all in the context of a man serving a lengthy prison sentence, in a letter handwritten to him by the judge, who has holds in his hands the keys to the jail, and you don't see anything improper with this. You equate this to a judge running into a hall and having a con make it, exchanging a comment to an attorney. Well, he is talking to an attorney. There's no question in, in, about this. Well, uh, he's well, a pro se litigant. I don't equate that with being an attorney. Well, when a person is representing themselves and they are filing their own motions... Did Mr. Skipper, have, did Mr. Skipper have an attorney during, during his, uh, his initial uh, in prosecution? His, in his initial trial, before, he, well, before his trial, I think he was represented by Mr. Carson. However, he discharged Mr. Carson from representing him at various points or at some point during these proceedings. I see nowhere in here where, where the judge is trying to understand if he has, if he is currently represented. Well, by that time he knew he wasn't. Mr. Mr. Skipper had been representing himself for a number of years at that point. When was, when was the, this, this letter occurred on uh, June 29, 2008? When was the judge's last contact with Mr. Skipper prior to that? The contact from Judge Booth to Mr. Skipper, right. or in that direction, uh, I don't know when they had last months. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, the, the, so he, the record so would reflect the last time they were in court. I'm sure that's the last time they had, that Mr. So, Judge so we're talking talked. years then, or months. It's possible. And isn't it also possible that Mr. Skipper could have retained an attorney during that period of time? How would Judge Booth know if he doesn't even bother to find out? 
Well, he is, I think that before a, an attorney is to be presumed to be involved in the case, you would expect to hear from that attorney saying, I'm enrolling as counsel. If you've got a litigant who's been representing himself for several years and has just contacted the judge with, a, with the letter of earlier that month, and you don't think it's too much to expect for the judge to make some inquiries to see whether this person may have retained counsel? To whom would he inquire? I mean, he, he would only well, be Mr. able to Skipper ask. Well, Mr. would be a good starting point. Well, it wasn't as if he could just simply pick up the phone and talk to, to Mr. Skipper. Well, he had no problem writing him handwritten letters. Exactly. That was the, and that was the only way to communicate with him. And so that's what he did. And he said, he said that I've not been unfair. I don't have any hatred. I don't have a point to make. And I'm not going to do anything for you unless the, unless the DA waives their objections. I, I don't think that he's, I don't think he's dangling a release from prison in front of him at all. Because he specifically says, you know, we, that definitely will not happen unless the DA agrees. So, I mean, this is, this is absolutely not a promise to let Mr. Skipper out of jail. Now, it's, it's, it, there may be some general commentary. What, what about, about Judge Booth's own statement that the, this letter could be construed as giving Mr. Skipper legal advice. Do you disagree with him on that? Well, I mean, the statement that something could be construed some way is a, is a pretty vague statement. I mean, almost anything could be construed almost any way possible. He went, he went on to say that he doesn't typically give legal advice to people. Well, certainly, yes, he does not typically give Which legal advice. Which could be an implication, well, in this case I did. I don't do it typically, but this time I did. Or this could be construed as legal advice. That is not, a, I don't think that's implied at all, Your Honor. I don't, if he says, I don't typically give legal advice, that, I don't think that's an admission that he's giving it in this case. Even I, though he says it could be construed as legal advice? Well, like I said, Your Honor, almost anything could be, could be construed in various ways. And it's one thing to say, well, I could see how someone might think that, but I certainly didn't intend it that way, and Mr. Skipper didn't take it that way. <clears throat> and I think that that is probably about the closest that Judge Booth, or about, you know, about the closest to what Judge Booth might have been thinking when he said, you know, it could be construed that way. Well, well then, you know, Judge Booth was asked, you know, whether this letter may have telegraphed a message. And he said, and his response was, I see that might be conveyed to him, meaning Mr. Skipper. Well, it's always possible for one's words to be misread. And so, Judge Booth so is he, merely so he, acknowledging so he could, that someone could So he could, could see misread. how this could be construed in the fashion that I'm referring to. He could see that, but he obviously didn't mean that. Right. And we're supposed to believe that. Yes. And in fact, what you're, uh, it's supposed to be proven by clear and convincing evidence that that's not it. And that's where the problem is. There is no clear and convincing evidence of Judge Booth's motive here. No clear and convincing evidence. Uh, again, this, this part of the, of the charges, like all the rest, relates to the bad faith issue. Now, <clears throat> the commission is trying to use these letters to sort of connect the dots to generate the idea that Judge Booth cooked up this situation, put this defendant up to filing a motion so that they could put on this evidence to hurt Judge Johnson and he could accomplish his sinister political aims. Well, why didn't he mention anything about the evidence against Judge Johnson in his letter? Why, not, why, didn't, why didn't he say, if he was going to be telling, if he was going to be telegraphing messages in that letter, why not say, well, you know, if you had information that someone in the judicial system had mistreated you, that might help your case. He didn't say that. If, he's, if, if he said, um, you know, you should file this motion and, uh, you know, say negative things about Judge Johnson, that, you know, that wasn't in there. If he's, if he's trying to, if he's using this exchange of letters to put Mr. Skipper up to doing this, he's not doing a very good job of it. He's not doing, he's not conveying very much about what he wants in that hearing in that letter, if in fact that's what he's doing. And of course, there's also the fact that it was Mr. Skipper, not Judge Booth or D.A. Johnson, who initiated this exchange of letters. It was Mr. Skipper who decided when to file his motion. <clears throat> and therefore determined the timing of all of this. And the commission thinks it's proved by clear and convincing evidence that it was just a happy coincidence for the sinister Judge Booth that this defendant just happened to, at the right time, file the, I mean, send this letter so that he could then manipulate him, excuse me, that he could then manipulate him into filing a motion which he didn't ask him to file and put on evidence which he didn't mention he should put on also, he could accomplish his sinister plot. It, it does not make any sense, Your Honor. When they got when they got to court, 
Pardon? When they, when they finally arrived after this change of letters and Mr. Skipper then filed his motion, they, they go to court. What evidence was put on at that hearing to justify the release of Mr. Skipper? Uh, the primary evidence was the evidence concerning the telephone conversations with Judge Johnson and Mr. Connor, and I believe Mr. Skipper might have also testified about some other conversations that he'd had with Mr. Skipper, I mean, with Mr. Connor, and possibly also Judge Johnson. Did they put on any evidence? Did they, his motion, as I appreciate it, was that he had hardship, correct? Was That's there right. any evidence about his hardship? Uh, that was, uh, that was addressed, but, uh, Judge Booth remarked that you know several, that a lot of evidence of this had already been put in, and Mr. Skipper elected not to put on his wife as uh, as a witness. Excuse and, me, would uh, you remind me again of who Mr. Connor is? Mr. Connor is Mr. Skipper's nephew, and okay. uh, maybe somebody's nephew, but I couldn't remember whose nephew he was. He's Mr. Skipper's oh, nephew, oh. and uh, he was also a justice of the peace uh, at the time. I'm not sure if he was a justice of the peace in 2002, but at some point. In the interim, he has been and no longer is. He's also uh, very active politically, a very close ally of Judge Johnson's. And um, he was, of course, uh, indisputably the one who told Mr. Skipper that he couldn't plead guilty. Um, Getting now, back to the, to the evidence put on at the hearing, and, and then opposing counsel suggests that the reasons that Judge Booth granted that um, motion was um, because of this conversation with Judge Johnson. Is, is that accurate or inaccurate, or what, well, happened, in the what happened at the hearing and, and what justified uh, Judge Booth changing his mind at this particular hearing after um, denying the motions summarily and, and uh, w without hearings and previously? Well, uh, not all of them have been denied summarily without hearing. Some had, some had not. But the Mr. most Skipper. recent ones, as I appreciate it, there were, there were a number of the most recent ones had been denied summarily, right? I, I believe that maybe the most recent one or two had, yes. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Your Honor, could you repeat? Oh, oh yes, never mind. Uh, uh, what what yeah, evidence justified granting the motion? Well, um, first of all, yes, Judge Booth did mention in his reasons for judgment that the manipulation of this defendant by Justin Connor and by Judge Johnson had affected his, uh, his legal interests, the, 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 the defendant's legal interests. However, there were also significant differences between this hearing and in the previous motions. This is the first time in the entire history of the case that the DA agreed with Mr. Skipper. At every previous turn, the DAs had vigorously opposed every one of Mr. Skipper's motions and had objected to everything. And, they were, and now you had a DA in agreement. That is a huge difference. I mean, uh, you're talking about a, a consent from the other party versus not having consent from the other party. And, and, and correct me if I'm mistaken, is the DA and Judge Booth cousins and the DA the ex-husband of Judge Johnson? Yes, Your Honor, that is true. Uh, uh, Mr. Johnson is, I believe, a third cousin to Judge Booth. And is the and is the former husband of Judge Kathy Johnson? Yes, that that, that does possibly bear mentioning. Uh, Judge Johnson, I mean uh, District Attorney Johnson, became elected DA in an election in which he ran against Judge Booth, and they, that was that was his initial election to the District Attorney's office. Um, but yes, Your Honor, there, there were quite a few significant differences this time, in addition to the manipulation by others of Mr. Skipper, which Judge Booth felt, uh, uh, it appears, raised uh, um, almost to a constitutional level. It's almost a deprivation of his fundamental right to a uh, fair trial, you know, advice of counsel, whatever you want to call it. I mean, this is, I mean, if he's being manipulated by others. How, how, who is he manipulated by? Well, it's clear that he was manipulated by Mr. Connor at the time he rejected his plea agreement. Uh, also, over the so, years... So everybody... How? Yeah, how, I mean, how does manipulation occur? I mean, every totally defendant has family members saying, you know, don't plead, go to trial, don't plead, go to trial. Uh, if you're not guilty, don't plead guilty. And, you know, that's an everyday occurrence, unfortunately. Well, in this particular situation, Your Honor, um, Mr. Connor was a de facto patriarch 
of the entire extended family of which Mr. Skipper was a member. And Mr. Connor did not merely say, you shouldn't plead guilty. You should go to trial. Mr. Connor said, we'll never speak to you again. You're out of the family if you plead guilty. You must reject the plea agreement. And it was in the testimony of Mr. Carson, who was present during this conversation and was at that time Mr. Skipper's attorney, said that Mr. Skipper appeared to be interested in the plea agreement, appeared to be leaning toward possibly taking it, and then as soon as Mr. Connor said that, that ended all discussion. And Mr. Skipper immediately said, no, I won't take it. So and, it's, a, it's clear that there was, was an undue was, amount of influence from Mr. Connor. Was there a suggestion in this testimony that Judge Johnson also was involved in the manipulation of Mr. Skipper? Not in 2002. That, that may or may not have occurred, but there's no, spe there's no specific evidence that at the time of the rejection of the plea bargain that that was the case. However, Mr. Skipper's case had proceeded for several years after that, and Mr. Skipper had pursued a strategy of attacking the court, filing motions to recuse, filing complaints against the judge, and it was during that time, at least in 2006, while Mr. Skipper was still doing these things, that he was at least discussing these things with Judge Johnson in secret, in a phone call. And um, <clears throat> in that respect, he was and, manipulated and by both. And there's a transcript of that telephone conversation in the record? Yes, Your Honor. The, 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 uh, my notes seem to suggest that that conversation is almost unintelligible? There have been very... Be transcribed? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, there were some Ill, uh, inaudibles. There were some inaudible entries in the, uh, in the conversation, many of which were uh, statements made by Judge Johnson. Is it that was a conversation in the jail which was recorded because it was jail or somebody was taping the judge? It was recorded because he was in jail. Okay. And, and there's one conversation, is that right? There's one that there was a recording of and a transcript of that recording put into evidence at this trial. Mr. Skipper has contended that he had more than one conversation but by phone in with evidence, Judge Johnson. There's one transcription of a conversation that Mr. Connor had with Mr. Skipper and then Mr. Connor uh, calls this judge uh, and she's, a th now it's a three-party conversation, but uh, from what I could tell, the conversation was unintelligible, and it's, there's not much that can be transcribed. Isn't that the fact? Well, parts of it are unintelligible, particularly the parts where Judge Johnson was speaking. However, uh, a reading of the, how the conversation progressed can give you an idea of what's being said on the other end. I mean, if she's, if she's not talking about what he's talking about, his, why would his con comments continue to follow along with uh, the flow of the conversation? And uh, one other last thing, Your Honor, uh, the, uh, the OSC has made a big deal out of the fact this was not filed in the record. And it should be noted that Mr. Skipper had filed a number of complaints against Judge Booth, and Judge Booth had separate files with the Judiciary Commission complaints about, against him from Judge Mr. Skipper. These letters were somehow filed in those instead of the, instead of the suit record. And as soon as, Judge Johnson, as soon as Judge Booth discovered them, he immediately produced them to OSC. Thank you. I apologize for going over, Your Honors. Yeah. Your Honors, in my very limited time that I have left, there's a few points I would like to hit. Uh, first of all, John Johnson, the district attorney, was not just a distant cousin. Judge Booth himself testified that he could read D.A. Johnson like a book, and D.A. Johnson could read him like a book. The district attorney personally handled this case and personally met with Mr. Skipper and personally told him what he needed to say if he wanted to get out of jail. Someone that Judge Booth has testified he is close to, and that is in the record. As far as whether Mr. Skipper took it that way, that he should file a motion, well, that's what Mr. Skipper testified to. He testified the reason he filed his, most re his last motion, the one that succeeded, was based on what he had gotten in the letter from Judge Booth. So that wasn't just implied. That's what it was taken as being. Also, I'd like to note that in the N. Ray Elwha case, and I apologize, I don't have the site with me, this court stated that historical practice and procedure in a district does not excuse judicial misconduct. And we would submit as for the... Uh, seeming practice of letting people out of jail when you can't, that the Elwha would say that the fact that was done before is no excuse. Lastly, 
Judge Booth has spent a lot of time talking about Judge Johnson. And what I would like this court to consider is that even if every word he says is true, and we do not concede that it is in any way, but even if she was out to get him and did every horrible thing under the sun, wouldn't that only create more reasons why he would need to recuse? Wouldn't that only make it less possible for him to be able to fairly hear a case which is sending around what she's allegedly done to him? We would respectfully submit that what Judge Booth is saying is not correct, but even if it were, it doesn't help him. It only makes his misconduct worse. If you have no further questions, Your Honor, I have nothing further to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.